quickly begin uh, tonight's show. Uh, I am very, I was very much looking forward to tonight, and uh, very kindly, how nice of you, sir, you accepted our request to come and join us. Uh, I've been reading your tweets for a while. I've been reading your blogs for a while. But I can honestly, honestly, honestly say I'm a big fan. The way uh, it's not just about how deep your research goes. It's also about how creatively and how fun you make that reading. Uh, you make that uh, reading make. Thank and, you. And you know, uh, uh, right from your uh, I like uh, your Mahindra article. Uh, sorry, Hero Motor Corp article. Your uh, uh, you know, uh, Delhi Valley Valley article. Uh, these are absolute gems, and for every investor, uh, especially retail investors who come into you know this uh, stock market and they do not, they are new to this world. But then this is very interesting to read, and it's very uh, stock market for a person who is not into stock market. It's a very dry subject, but your articles and your tweets and your content makes it so much fun. So a big thank you for that to you, first of all. Thank you, thank you. I'm just uh, trying to write uh, whatever I find interesting. Yeah, uh, that's that's really amazing, sir. All uh, right. So, today, ka sir, log, of course, we'll try to learn a lot from you, and also we would like to uh, learn about you. Uh, so, uh, but before we go there, uh, let's quickly, एक बार थोड़ा सा market view. You also track a lot of uh, uh, factors, I think, a lot of uh, indices, a lot of uh, foreign markets. So, Pel, before we get into, I want to know from you, like, how did you get into stock markets and what is your philosophy, investment philosophy, and everything. But before we get into that, thoda sa market ka discuss if we can, um, discussion if we can do. And what is your view on the market right now? And uh, for a while, there was a big, uh, there was a very decisive split between uh, investors and traders on social media. That market, some were very bearish, some were very. bullish but as of now it seems that bulls are kind of uh, holding on but uh, what do you think what does your analysis say right now sir uh sure so uh, i'll put a caveat that uh, i'm not really like i may have a big following but i'm don't consider myself a very big expert or anything i'm just following whatever i read about and try to make sense out of it so uh, i also do not try to guess every day short term moves uh in in my view if you look at the larger themes there are only like two one is inflation and other one is recession due to it uh, so uh, inflation in india i don't think is that big of a problem uh, majority of inflation is around because of oil and food prices so food we have largely have under control we have our own supply we feed ourselves uh, but uh, oil is something which is the completely opposite story um, in the short term medium term oil may kind of uh, come down uh, and that might lead to uh, some uh, breath- breathing way for our emerging markets so in that regard i i feel inflation is pretty much under control within the emerging markets and i've written a piece about it as to why uh, it's out of control and out of whack in western countries um with regards to western countries the other big theme is the recession which i feel they will enter into it it all it's all very dynamic and depends on how federal reserve acts throughout the course uh, if they follow a pre 70s approach where they raise rates and stop uh, and then watch what happens to inflation and then they raise again rates again that's a very haphazard way of dealing with it um, so there's the other way is you continuously raise rates irrespective of uh, whether inflation is taming down or not and hope one day it kind of comes down uh, which is uh it is known to kind of work that's what paul walker did in 1970s uh when he took charge um so uh, it's all very dynamic in that regard i do think that they have kind of uh not been proactive so there will be some sort of a slowdown in the next 12 18 months in us uh how deep is that slowdown whether it leads to a big recession or just tiny blimp it depends on all these dynamic factors of what federal reserve does what's the demand supply situation like across uh but in the short term i i feel emerging markets like india will do much better we may not see the ferocious bull market that we saw in 2021 uh for another 12 18 months uh so my view point is until elections of 2024 there may be a kind of a okayish kind of a market not a very uh high raising bull market of 2021 but after the elections when 
clouds clear away, uh, everything might be in a better shape and form. So that's when things can be good. Uh, but again, like this is just an individual's opinion. I'm not a macro expert or anything. Uh, this is based on my readings of and my judgment of things that I read. Absolutely brilliant, sir. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, so, uh, right. So now let's get down to knowing you a little bit and uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. How did you reach here, sir? How did you get introduced to stock markets and how did you come to be who you are today? How did your journey into stock markets begin? So, uh, what happened all of it? Yeah, so finance has always been uh, pretty, like one of my favorite subjects. So, and more than finance was around business. My dad is a businessman. So uh, as a kid, I was always kind of wondering as to what makes a good business uh, better and uh, how do businesses work. So that kind of, that curiosity led me into this world. And uh, I chose finance, uh, in, study finance in high school, did that in college, uh, uh, pursued my CFA, got into Goldman because of all of that. Um, it stayed with and throughout the six, seven years at Goldman, I kind of refined it a bit more. Um, and then I kind of left uh, Goldman and now I work for Visa, uh, the payments company. And so it, it's been a journey and it's always something that been very exciting to me. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much. And over the last, I would say 10 12 years I've been continuously studying this field. So that's been, uh, that helped me kind of understand things a bit better. Right. Awesome. Awesome. And sir, uh, so, so I believe, so the kind of things that I've read on your blogs and your tweets, I think you're primarily a very much common sense investing slash fundamental investor. Uh, but how would you describe your, uh, but I, of course, I've also seen you also look at charts and uh, some technicals as well. Yeah. Uh, so, but how would you describe your uh, investment and trading strategy slash philosophy? Uh, I would say I, I don't belong to any camp. I try to use, my main goal is to, I have a, for me, uh, investing is about my financial journey and uh, I have a set goal in mind that has always been there even 10 years ago. Uh, so over the last 10 years, I'm basically chipping away and slowly kind of in making incremental progress to that goal. Uh, charting, uh, technicals, uh, fundamentals, uh, all different sorts of investing, growth, momentum, value, whatever, is all just my way of kind of using all the tools at my disposal to get to that goal. Um, so I don't limit myself. I don't look down upon other uh, uh, things about other philosophies in investing. Uh, most people think like value investing is the only way to make money. And if you're not holding a company forever, you're doing some uh, something sinful. Um, I don't believe in that philosophy. I, I try to use everything. I do short-term trades. I, I even look at, uh, mostly I try to, fig my goal is to figure out good businesses uh, that I can kind of, uh, so, and we don't even have a large enough universe. We have like 1,200 companies above the range of 500 crores in market cap. So if you, within those 1200, if you remove all the government run entities, if you remove entities without, uh, which have governance issues, uh, your universe keeps on getting smaller. So my goal is to kind of study that universe, which I seem is feasible to study in, in a decade. Um, and that's where I'm trying to figure out basically and rest everything else is kind of just on top of that to help me uh, understand things better. Like technicals, for example, are very good to uh, figure out uh, when the price may correct a lot uh, versus what's the correct price to buy. Uh, because uh, I don't believe technicals show you a forecast uh, and things are like that, but they can very well tell you uh, about what's the levels of prices where there has been previous demand. So mm -hmm. there's a pattern there and that those are probably price, good prices to buy. So if you combine all of that, it, it kind of helps you um, become a better investor. Okay. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, sir. Uh, so if I may ask, uh, what is your, so you said you take all kinds of trades uh, from short term to long term and everything, but major, majorly what uh, is, do you have a favorite time horizon maybe key you would do some three to six months or something like that, or that is also completely depending on the scenario? Uh, complete depends on my my uh, usually ninety percent of my book is long term investments, 
So uh, I look at uh, long term in nature. That's that's the first. Everything else is kind of just uh, very short. Like ten percent of the book may be short term or uh, hedging or F and O trades, and those are mostly to kind of help me uh, build more cash uh, to again feed on the ninety eight percent long term investments. Right. Great. Uh, okay. Next uh, question is: So you already said, uh, kind of uh, told us that uh, you have like you go f- prefer companies with some uh, good market cap of over 500 crores, and then uh, some fundamental factors that they should have a good governance and everything. Uh, but in general, could you estimate what would be the size of one? What would be the size of your watch list that you kind of keep an eye on? And second, how many companies? So this is a question which I uh, really want to ask every expert that I can ask. Uh, about portfolio sizing as in how many companies uh, do you prefer to stay invested in at a time so from uh, receiving answer some people prefer a very concentrated portfolio that they have to churn something out if they want to buy something new and i've also met some experts who have even gone up to 50 companies or are or my person favorite peter lynch uh, i'm a fan of peter lynch he to went ahead with like 1500 companies at one point in his portfolio yeah. so uh, what is do you have a uh, si- sizing strategy around that sir sure uh, so i answer the first question first around watch list and stuff so um, uh, i have about core watch list of 40 uh, and that keeps evolving so what i'm doing these days is kind of looking at all the companies and one by one trying to like i said if it's a government run entity i immediately remove it uh, if it's a uh, if it has previous governance lag i immediately remove it so th- that list i'm going through uh, so in a way earlier i used to look at uh, run screeners and then find stocks or some stocks that my friends might be talking about or other investor friends might tip me on uh, i used to include them now i've kind of gone the other way i'm taking the entire universe and can using the process of elimination to arrive at a list um, that i need to study of uh, those companies uh, that's that's one the other is around uh, number of stocks and allocation it depends on yourself so it depends uh, what kind on your risk appetite uh, so you you mentioned peter lynch the reason why he used to have 1500 companies is because a his portfolio was value the assets on the management that he was managing couple billion dollars was very very huge and his way of investing was he would buy the entire companies in the entire value chain uh, so for example auto ancillaries are the rage these days so he would buy every auto ancillary company that he thought was fit and tough uh, and then uh, with a very small allocation to all of them. and he would sit and watch as to which companies will do better so as and when the fundamentals of the company starts improving he will sell the ones that had deteriorating fundamental factors and keep allocating more uh, to the ones that were doing well so that that his process was again a process of elimination he bought the entire thing and then looked at what was doing well he could do, afford to do that because he had that much uh, aum to manage uh, it, so uh, if it depends on you if you, for example you have only 10% of your wealth allocated to equities and you uh, and that 10% mean let's say mean 10 lakh rupees if you are buying 50 companies of that 10 lakh rupees that is not a very good strategy for you because first of all you only have uh, 10% of your overall wealth allocated to equities and within that you are kind of diversifying it even bit and that capital is not that big enough to make any mean, meaningful returns if you diversify and chip away a lot uh, so where is someone who has let's say a 100 crore portfolio and is allocating 50% to equities now for him investing into 10 or 15 companies may not uh, be uh, much more risky and his goal might not be to generate uh, 20 25% kind of returns his goal might be to generate 10 to 12% kind of kind of returns so for him uh, having a concentrated portfolio doesn't make sense so it's it's all Con- uh, context related it depends on what you what your goal is and what your risk appetite is uh, and then you kind of need to decide whether you need to have 10 companies six companies or 50 companies um, so yeah that's my long answer right uh, great sir thank you so much for sharing that okay next question sir i want to ask is about your exit strategy so uh, a lot of people have uh, a lot of things for entries i also do but i fail miserably at my exits uh, what is your exit strategy how do you decide when to exit 
Yeah, so I, I, that's one of my biggest problems as well. I uh, have been known to not sell on time. Uh, and that's something that I've been learning. Um, so uh, I've started taking use of the help of technicals. And when there's a breakdown of a trend or something, uh, that, that's where I look at things. Uh, it also depends on valuation. Sometimes things are very clearly overvalued. At that point of time, you have to make a call whether even if you don't, like I at least stop allocating more to it. So I don't have that habit of continuously buying at, in respect of any valuation. So uh, even if you're not getting out, uh, the best way is to at least put a, you can put a, like a very deep stop loss based on charts uh, where if something goes very, very wrong, you at least get out at 10%, 20% drawdown rather than 50% drawdown. Uh, so that's one. Uh, other than that, fundamentals is something. If, if something goes wrong in the company, something, uh, the story or the thesis I set for myself before entering into the company as an investment, if that goes wrong, then that's a clear out. Uh, and then I don't, uh, I never kind of average down my losers. Uh, if something is going to a loss, it's either you need to stay in the portfolio and needs to get out. That's the only decision. The third decision is not there that you need to buy more. Uh, so that's where I, I would say, uh, but it's a very complicated area, especially for me. Like I am still learning when to sell. I have not mastered or perfected that yet. Right. Perfect. Sir. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okay. Uh, next that I want to ask, uh, so this is now again, uh, we come back to thoda sa contemporary times and uh, so now next question, whatever we discuss is not a buy or sell recommendation. This is all for educative purposes. But according to you uh, right now, what if I may ask, what is there on your watch list right now? What are, What is getting you excited right now? It, it may be sectoral uh, wins that you see somewhere or it may be uh, any particular stocks that are uh, you think have a good potential. And thoda sa, so the, the uh, purpose of asking this question is to kind of understand your process a little bit more. Uh, so the way when you tell your watch list, I would also love to know ki why do you think uh, this is going to be good in the coming time? Sure. So my watch list mostly has special situation stocks in it and uh, tech companies in US uh, and some com some tech and auto companies in India. Uh, and I am a very boring kind of investor. Like my largest allocation these days goes to the Nasdaq index fund. Uh, so I am buying the index uh, and with the view that uh, so these all companies are like at very, very deep drawdowns. Uh, so Google, Amazon, and all of those top firms, they, they're pretty, uh, like, they're very good companies, obviously. Uh, they have stable growth, uh, and it's not like that growth is going away anytime soon. Uh, but they are pretty cheap, so I allocate there. Uh, a couple of special situations that I'm working on is those. Uh, some of the companies in India, it's, it's not very sector-specific that I have to invest in this sector only. Uh, it, it's all very bottoms up company specific so uh may i have a one or two examples if i may sir uh sure so uh companies like piramal for example is pretty cheap there's again not a recommendation i hold a position in it uh, uh I, like companies like dvs for example uh if you look at the long-term 10-year chart of valuation history of dvs it's it's uh pretty much at the bottom of uh, out at the mean level where so it's the entire uh, value has been reverted to mean so that's where i've been investing uh, and these are companies which are which have consistently grown their cash flows have grown their uh, sales and profits uh, have very good governance history uh, so very boring kind of investments in piramal for example I'm invested mostly for their pharma business that's going to demerge. I don't consider it a special situation, but I, at this price, I feel that the pharma business is valuable and I'm getting a bargain. So that's where I've been invested. So it, it depends on company to company. And that's two or three examples of it. Right. Great, sir. great. Thank you so much for sharing that. So I have a lot more questions uh, with me right now. Uh, but before I so uh, before I continue there, I had pinned a tweet in this in this space asking our audience to ask any questions they may have for you. So we have got a few questions. So let me take up uh, their questions first, and then uh, beach mein time milega, I'll ask my other questions as well. Sure. Okay. 
तो सर पहला क्वेश्चन हम लोगों को सुरेंद्र सर का आया था ही वॉन्टेड टू नो अबाउट पेपर इंडस्ट्री सो इन केस यू आर ट्रैकिंग दिस सेक्टर और एनी कंपनी फ्रॉम पेपर इंडस्ट्री यू है एडवाइजरी सर्विस कॉल ऑर एम कैपिटल एंड जितिन परमर एंड इस टीम सो आई आई कैंड यू जस्ट फॉलो दैन दे आर बेटर uh like so in any so i have very few core competencies and my way to get around it is i would rather subscribe to uh the guys who know this place better than form my opinion on my own so uh i have identified over the last few years uh in each like for cyclicals who's the person to listen to for farmer who's the person to listen to so that i kind of follow that and if they have any advisory or paid service or newsletters things like that i kind of i'm happy to pay for it as well so that's i kind of broaden my research circle that way great thank you so much for that sir it's it's uh, refreshing how brutally honest and down to earth you are i'm <laughs> so open to sharing your uh, practices yeah <laughs> right uh the next question is from ujwal sir he is asked view on sectors or stocks to play the mega trend theme it depends on mega trend theme you're talking about these days everything like if you look at it any history from here everything seems like a mega trend and uh, for example cloud is going cloud computing is going on biotech will be something that will uh, occur battery technology is something uh, there's a lot of things happening in semiconductor so uh, it depends on what you what team you pick at and then it depends on uh, whether those companies are listed in india or you are okay to invest abroad as well um, so within india i think two mega trends are playing now, right now which is manufacturing uh, we will go through a manufacturing re- renaissance in this country uh, that's inevitable uh, we started every kind of country goes through uh, it be- it's first in agriculture economy then goes to manufacturing then goes to services and uh that's how they rise that's been china's uh, theme as well that's been uh, other countries theme as well through history but uh, india kind of flipped it we did agriculture then services and now we are kind of building that manufacturing infrastructure base so that's one then you will have uh, in that manufacturing theme you have all sorts of manufacturing in india from chemicals to uh, cdmo to discovery drug discovery to uh, infrastructure to uh textile so you will kind of see india coming up through uh and, and as a global percentage low single digits of these manufacturing is done in india so even if uh we kind of double it from here in the next decade that's a very big market that you are looking at so i and I, i think that's the main trend in india and main mega theme that you can talk about uh, other than tech tech side it side we have always dominated and we will continues to do that uh on the services side of it you may also see a lot of uh, new global technology businesses from india kind of emerging and getting listed um so companies like delivery and all uh, they are going uh, they are not just thinking of themselves for an india uh, land base which earlier used to companies through they are also going to southeast asia and kind of starting to uh, dominate there as well so you will see companies from india emerging uh, selling products to a global customer base or at least uh, dominating the southeast asia region of it so those i think two or three structural themes from india great absolutely brilliant sir thank you so much for sharing that uh great so next question sir uh, deepak sir ka hai and he has asked about uh, we kind of slightly touched on that but he has uh, asked your thoughts about index funds i think they are brilliant and uh, i personally invest a lot through index like i mentioned my largest position is the nasdaq index yes. excel today uh, and if let's say i i know a lot of people are not uh, this finicky about Uh, and this passionate about finance uh, so i believe that for a, for 90% of the people in this world the easiest way to build build wealth is through index uh, it, it has its own nuances around it but uh, if you want a low cost low effort kind of a way to do it uh, you can never go wrong in an index fund um, as long as you're in a country which has growth so that's a pretty good way i think india is growing so us has grown um, there are other indexes as well in europe which has 
the economies haven't grown that much, but the index has kept up with it. So I think it's a very good way to build wealth. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, next question, sir, Pahadi sir ka aya hai and he has asked, uh, any recommendations on how to mix technicals in our investment journey? Any good sources for beginners? So there also we kind of touched, but specifically to this question, if you have any thoughts, sir. Sure. Uh, so I'm not a technicals expert. I'm learning. Uh, it's only been, I would say, six months since I have really started to learn in this area. Um, but in so I um, the way I use it today is to identify uh, price action through it. I, I believe technicals are a visualization of de demand and supply for a stock or it can be any instrument. And if you look at the history of it, you, you can easily identify areas where uh, there's clear cut demand where stock has like, for example, uh, at a particular position, uh, at a particular price level, the demand of the stock usually is higher or, or the supply is higher. So those kind of things, you can figure it out. Uh, so that's where I use uh, to come with my investing to figure out areas to average uh, into if I want to uh, and areas where things kind of uh, look shaky if something breaks down in a particular price level, it's it's a free fall after that. Uh, so those are the areas where I use. Uh, I believe the best way to learn is to always go to the source. Uh, unfortunately, in our industry, there's a lot of uh, versions of the sources, uh, a lot of noise. Everybody has an opinion on it. So I always go to the golden sources, which is fundamentals, in my view, are the CFA books. Uh, even if you don't want to pursue a CFA or get a de degree or a distinction in CFA, uh, the, you can still go through those books and they, they teach you from the very basics and it's the practical application of it you can obviously cut down and remove all the quant parts of it which you don't care about but uh, for example equities book in cfa from a level one it will tell you everything about capital markets and help you build that foundation and similarly for technicals you should look at the cmt books because those are the books those have been the institute since 1980s when this uh, field kind of started emerging and evolving. So they, they have been kind of building that from from the start. So, and everybody in the world, whether uh, all the tech, huge technical trader stars in the world, legends, you, they also have learned from that place or from that subject material in that book. So that's the golden source and you should always go to the golden source uh, before you go to anybody else. Right. Uh, perfect, sir. Uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, next question, sir, Webhav, sir, ki se, how has CFA helped you in investing and trading? And do you recommend the syllabus for beginners? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, so, so towards the uh, beginning of this podcast, you told us that CFA has kind of helped you in your journey. Yeah. So Webhav, sir, wants to know how has it helped and do you recommend the syllabus for beginners? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it helped me. So I've been doing CFA since my, uh, I would say, the third year of college. Um, and so it's been a long journey. And uh, the way it helped me is it's there's a lot to capital markets outside of equities. Um, so you get via CFA, you get to learn about everything else. Uh, and I'm a very big history buff as well. So I, I look at history to learn as to how things evolved. It kind of puts a gives that clarity around uh, some things. So I look at that and uh, uh, the way CFA has helped me is kind of build that foundation for me. Uh, when you talk about things like uh, what's a discount rate, uh, usually somebody who is not into equities, they wouldn't know that or any of the guys that usually went how people learn these days, they go to YouTube or Twitter. Nobody's going to teach you that. Uh, nobody's focusing on that. Everybody's focusing on stocks. And that's one of the reasons I kind of started writing threads on Twitter because I thought that it's a good way to help people learn about the basics. Uh, so when you look, when you're going through a CFA curriculum, it will teach you about that. And from that discount rate concept, you can link it to everything else. You can link it to valuations. You can link it to uh, even fixed income side of the business. So all of that helps you a lot. Uh, the concept of time value of money of all of that nobody is going to teach you uh, if you don't go to these books uh, it's very hard to come by uh, so if, for example if you're reading a book on coffee can investing or anything else uh, these guys are not going to teach you those basics and uh, without getting that basics right you 
you may still follow that approach, but you may not be following it in the right spirit of that approach. Uh, so I, I think that's why it's important and that's how it helps. Right. Uh, perfect. Thank you so much for that, sir. Uh, okay, Mirpas, there's a barrage of questions. I don't know which to pick. For our audience, please help us uh, pick questions. Uh, jo tweet, uh, the, the, a tweet is pinned on this space. The questions that you like, please like them, and I'll try to pick those with the maximum likes first, because there are just too many questions for me to ask. Uh, okay, so next... Uh, uh, okay, this is a Sandeep sir's question. Eh? Uh, in case you are tracking, uh, in case you have a thought on any of this, uh, your thoughts on real estate sector, inflation and recession impact in this sector? Sure. Uh, so like I said at the beginning, I don't believe there will be a significant slowdown of growth in emerging markets, especially in India, because we are at least even in inflation part, because not the reasons I explained, like food we have taken care of and uh, most of our growth is consumer led and our own economy has done pretty good, uh, has been resilient and even through COVID, we kind of didn't make the mistakes of giving too much stimulus to the economy. Um, so all of that plays well in our favor. Uh, if there's a recession in the Western world, oil prices will go down. That also helps with with our uh, the domestic economy. Uh, so with, with, in regards to that, real estate in India should do just fine. Uh, there's a the most amount of population in India is between the ages of 30 and 45 years of age. That's the highest portion of our demographic. And that portion is basically, is the prime uh, customer for the real estate industry. So even like that, that, that age group is going to start or has already started rather buying uh, houses. So that's why you see a revival of demand. And this industry has gone through 12 years of lull period. Uh, and a lot of uh, changes has been made in the industry with regards to regulatory side as well as the uh, industry side. It has consolidated a lot. So all of that plays well. Um, on the Western side, you have already seen housing demand and everything slowing down there. Uh, and for a lot of years, they were at obscenely, like obscene prices at that in the real estate side. So there you will see a lot of uh, demand shrinkage. Uh, so the Indian companies, uh, which majorly cater to uh, the Western side of, of the real estate market, via like products, for example, like Crystal and all, they may see a slowdown in their exports and things like that. But domestic market will still be good. So you can play it with housing finance companies or real estate developers or uh, housing product companies, housing furnishing companies, all of that should do well, as long as they are domestic. If they're majority into exports, they may see a slowdown. Great. Great, sir. Thank you so much for sharing that, sir. Uh, okay, so we have a few likes in the comments. And uh, Abhishek, sir, question is on uh, your view on power sector. So in case uh, you have some thoughts on that, sir. Sure. Again, power sector is like very big. Uh, so you have uh, Indian companies are I am playing this sector through IEX, which uh, I believe is a very good stock to play the sector too. Uh, I do. I don't like. I've studied power sector. There's a lot of problems with it. This I have written an article on my blog as well. You can uh, read about that. It's a very detailed blog on uh, what the Indian power industry looks like. Uh, I do not think that, like, apart from the solar side of the business and the new energy side of business, I do not think there's. Uh, enough things in going on in the business uh, today in the industry today. Uh, it's mostly dominated by uh, government-run entities um, and uh, other good thing going on in the sector which looks investable to me is the whole area of smart meters uh, and the migration from uh, our usual meters to smart meters. So there are one or two companies that you can look at uh, that cater to that part. But other than that, I don't think there's a lot happening. Or is invested. Right. Uh, wait. Thank you so much for that, sir. Uh, okay. Next question is from Raghav, sir, and he wants to know how to have a comprehensive view of the economy, finance, and markets, uh, not just uh, stock markets, but in general. And what resources do you recommend reading for this? The only way to do that is to like get your basics right. So your fundamentals right, uh, and then build that strong foundation. So like I said, this, those CFA kind of books help you. 
uh, within CFA, there's economics as well as a subject. Those books are very good. Uh, and uh, read a lot. Like I, the best way I get brushed up on news is and what trends is I have a bunch of newsletters. I have a dedicated ID, uh, email ID where I get all those newsletters. So every morning, uh, I kind of just go through all the like twenty something newsletters that come to my inbox on the previous day. So that's been my routine for like years now. So uh, the more you read, the more you will start connecting. Uh, and the best part about this industry, like in our like this fun investing, is there's never a dull day. There's a, everything you can learn something. Uh, for example, all the all through this uh, correction, I've learned so much about metals, how copper behaves. Uh, I've learned about emerging market index, uh, about why how why the demand for dollar goes up, uh, and how it it's a precursor and an indicator to um, risk off uh, sentiment in the uh, equities markets. How it can how they, like copper, for example, going down can predict recessions. Uh, inverted yield curves and all of that is all you, you're basically learning while through experiencing it. Uh, and if you have help of books around you, uh, whether it's a CFA curriculum or these newsletters, or you learn to kind of, uh, there's a lot of amazing blogs as well that write about things. Uh, and most of them, they give it out for free. So uh, that that's a pretty great way, in my opinion, to kind of learn. And there's never a dull day, so. It's all good. <laughs> right. Thank you so much for that, sir. Okay. Uh, next question, sir, uh, is from Naren, sir, and he wants to know your views on banking sector. I mean, I'm not an expert in this sector, uh, so I, I don't know a lot. Uh, I purposely do not follow finance and banking firm to that extent because uh, they're by by design they are leverage entities. Um, so uh, it is and most of the kind of bust happened in that sector. Uh, so the easiest way I do go about playing is it I, I've seen the banking names today, the top three, four, they're all beaten down black and blue because uh, the foreign institutional investors in our country are selling them. Uh, they have the highest ownership in that. So in my view, they are pretty like cheap. So I would just buy the bank, bank Nifty index uh, allocated to it. And when things kind of improve in the next two, three years, I'll sell it. Uh, but I don't invest in finance companies or banks or any of those, uh, even the non-NBFCs or any of those financial companies, uh, just because they are by design leverage entities and there are a lot of things to go wrong and you have to really, really look at them with a magnifying lens every time. So that's why. Right. Uh, great. Thank you so much for answering that, sir. Uh, okay, so this is an interesting question. It's getting a lot of likes. Uh, Trader Zombie, sir, ka question hai, and he has asked, which industries are going to benefit from China plus one? Uh -huh. All sorts of manufacturing industries. So uh, it's not even about China plus one. It's, it's about manufacturing moving to a second base. So uh, it doesn't have to get a substitute from China. It can be a substitute from Bangladesh, from Vietnam, from... Uh, Indonesia, Thailand, all of those places as well. So as I said, within so Southeast Asia is anyways a hub for global manufacturing. Uh, so of all the manufacturing products, uh, right till now, before pandemic, everything had been had a one sole supplier kind of philosophy, uh, where and companies kind of went along with it because uh, economies of scale brought down your cost down. Uh, but pandemic all. all like kind of threw a wrench into that philosophy and they had to think about it. Uh, so that's why things are moving. So for textiles, uh, India, for example, uh, got into a free trade agreement with Australia. So all our textile products uh, doesn't have to go through any tax treaties or any of that. Uh, there's a free trade agreement with it. So that manufacturing, that side of the business, uh, that industry can revive itself. Uh, then you have from the UK as well, we are entering into a free trade agreement. We may into, enter into free trade agreement with US as well. So uh, all of that uh, bodes well for the manufacturing. So it's manufacturing for everything. You saw an impact in the chemical side in 2021 when specialty chemicals, all that business kind of 
uh, all those companies went through two absurd valuations. Uh, you see it on the pharma API side. Uh, contract manufacturing is already booming in India. Uh, firms like Dixon, Hindustan Foods, uh, all of that there, uh, whether it's electronic manufacturing or food food processing and all of that is already doing well. So any sort of manufacturing that uh, can be can doesn't doesn't have a has a sole supplier base in Southeast Asia uh, has a very good chance of getting India as a another second supplier. So I would say all sorts of manufacturing will do it. Great, great. Thank you so much for answering that, sir. Uh, sir, thori der pehle we discuss a question uh, in which uh, you uh, said, said that you, you also have a separate uh, account for you know just receiving newsletters and following up on reading. Yeah. So, uspe ek follow up question hai Raghav sir ka ki could you uh, share some of the newsletters that you particularly like? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I, I know Brad is on the call. He's listening. So, uh, he runs a very good newsletter called Stock Market Nerd about his uh, companies. So, that's one on my in on my blog as well. You have a bunch of recommendations. Uh, there's a lot of uh, guys who like, for example, uh, there's a newsletter called The Century of Bio, uh, and it's written by a guy uh, who's a PhD uh, in biotechnology at Stanford. Uh, all the the entire newsletter is just about biotechnology. So it's it's someone with a deep knowledge, kind of sharing his content uh, and uh, everything that's happening in that world. Uh, then it's just so you can find it on my blog. A lot of recommendations that are already there. Um, and uh, other than these substacks, I look at like Bloomberg has very good newsletters around. Uh, like I think they have twenty plus newsletters. You can just pick and choose whichever you think is correct for you and suited for you. They have a newsletter, for example, on China. I've been reading that for almost five six years now, and it does a very good comprehensive uh, updates about what's happening to Chinese economy and those stocks, which not not a lot of people are prone uh, have a knowledge about. So that's uh, another one. Um, Quads has very good publications. Then on YouTube, uh, this is the hack itself that you can use. Uh, so again, you have a different ID. Uh, just uh, let the algorithm watch only the content that you find useful in learning about uh, from that ID. And what that will do is basically train the algorithm to suggest you uh, new videos around those topics. So anything related to research or sectors, I kind of use YouTube and I have a dedicated ID. I don't watch like music videos, for example, through that ID. So it kind of doesn't mess up the algorithm. Uh, and uh, yeah, all these videos, you can kind of have playlists around it. You can build your playlist and kind of just uh, add those videos across. Uh, and uh, another hack that I use is I have my own private Discord server where each company has its own channel. And all I do is basically just keep posting notes uh, and collecting information if I some something something comes interesting comes across. So I it in the end it kind of becomes like a dedicated channel with all my thoughts and uh, documents that I collect or information I collect around the company. And all I need to do is just read through that channel whenever I kind of need to revisit something. So the so you you, you can employ a bunch of things, uh, but those are a couple of ways I go about. Right. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of that, sir. Uh, okay. Next question, sir. Ye thoda or broader finances ka in general hai, uh, which basically asks ki how do you increase your uh, sources of income? Uh, sure. So, so this is a uh, space dedicated to stock markets, but I think if there was ever a guest who can who should answer this, it's you. I think. Sure. Uh, so with regards to your sources of income, you have to think about. Uh, like there's something so one is obviously passive and something is that you can do as a side hustle so uh, the way I have gone about things is for example uh, like I give you a very simple example I have, I have a personal finance or a uh, data visualization course uh, I learned a tool called Tableau uh, pretty like five six years ago uh, and I've kind of gained a mastery in it it's something that I use for work as well so I created a very tiny like a one hour course on it and put it up on Skillshare uh, earlier, like slowly and steadily, it started getting views. And every month Skillshare sends me like $100 for it, uh, for the viewership that comes through. So that kind of takes care about some of my expenses. So, But that's a very small example of it. You can obviously get into dividend companies. You can 
uh, you can do something uh, uh, things like courses that i tell, told you about it doesn't have to be at a very big ginormous state, scale where it kind of supplements your income but every little thing helps it will get you there uh, and in in my view the way i have kind of built that base is i've always paid myself first which means as soon as uh, i get my monthly paycheck i a certain percentage of that gets automatically deposited into a savings account which gets into uh, automatically to mutual funds so i've done that for 9 years running uh, and uh, every year i kind of look at my expenses and figure out areas where i can cut down on useless expenses so all of that uh, over the years have led to a, like a large gap between my income versus what my expenses are today these days i save in north of 50% of my income very easily and uh, all of that basically helps you out so it doesn't have to be that you create ginormous sources of second income you can do that at a very small scale and then kind of figure out ways to kind of build on top of that right uh, perfect sir absolutely perfect thank you so much for sharing that uh, okay next question is from ayush sir and he is uh, it's an interesting question how to learn hedging from the very scratch cf is the only source or are there some books so, uh, one can refer uh so i don't know about any books other than cfa i've learned it in cfa through the options uh, book in that uh, there are a couple of basic things like zero da has a varsity page uh, which can tell you but these are again like very basics uh, you don't get very enough knowledge in these to figure out uh, different strategies or kind of uh, learn the depth of it uh, those things will only come through either cfa or you pay uh lakhs and lakhs rupees to some courses which again may or may not be, be that good whereas you can get like a cfa entire curriculum for 1500 rupees so i would go with cfa <laughs> right perfect sir uh okay next sir kuch uh, stock specific questions hain jin pe likes hain kafi sare so i'll quickly run them through in case you track them we can discuss them or otherwise we can skip them sure i would just put a caveat that i'm not a savvy investor investment advisor so nothing it should be considered as investment advice definitely and not, uh, absolutely i also said the same thing earlier but i will reiterate none of this is a buy or sell recommendation please do your own research this is just for educative purposes uh right so uh uh first one is by sapna ji and uh, the question is on uh, bearing manufacturing company so this is more of a sector uh, in case you are tracking it uh so i don't track this sector a lot uh, i have recently started studying it uh there's a so i i the, what i can say is again related to the whole manufacturing theme where some of the manufacturing uh, is moving to india and some of these small tiny man bearing manufacturer are also doing exports now uh, so all that helps a lot uh, but i'm not an expert in it i'm just started reading it so no opinions right perfect sir uh, next sir uh, nifty are ek 5000 new trader sir ka question hai and he apparently asked this question earlier as well in our spaces but we couldn't take it up uh, so his question is on jsw energy and tata power he wants to know if they are fundamentally good companies and stocks to invest and uh, like his horizon is more like of 5 years or end of this decade can they be multi baggers from this point okay i don't know if they can be multi baggers or not uh, i have no opinion on jsw uh, they are getting into hydrogen and stuff uh, but uh, i don't know more about that tata power i was invested in but i think it's very highly overvalued in my opinion uh and uh, i i get the reason why data paper has so much uh like the stock price has shot up a lot more uh, because of the whole solar area but uh, all of that solar uh, projects that they do do it via their subsidiary which has received outside investment so eventually it will be a de merger or a separate listing so in my opinion uh if tata power pulls a biocon which is when biocon listed in gene separately uh the biocon investors didn't really saw anything of that not even a preferential allotment uh and sin gene 
today is like uh, 75% owned by Viacom still. Uh, so you you that value of yours will see a long gestation period to kind of if you are investing because of the solar business. So that's one of the reasons why I exited that stock and it went up again like from my exit price it went up 1x more so uh, what do i know <laughs> right thank you so much for sharing that sir yeah. okay uh, next sir uh, a question is on dinesh sir ka question hai iifl securities in case you are tracking it no i don't track like i said finances okay. i don't track it yeah uh okay then bk garg sir ka question hai uh, this iex we kind of discussed earlier he wants to know uh, can we see competition in exchange power sector uh, specifically iex and ptc india sure so ptc doesn't have exchange now, right now they they are building it uh and the the thing with with this sector is there's a network effect in it you you can't just set up an exchange and uh overnight get players there and uh, for ptc to divert all its volumes to that uh, they'll have to uh, get get sell the equity away there's a rule that uh, if you are let's say work coordinating on your if you're the largest buyer or seller on your own exchange you cannot control the exchange so with that regard the whole notion of P- ptc will set up its own exchange and kind of divert volumes away doesn't have any legal ground to it uh so that's why i believe iex will still kind of be okay uh and this market is so huge that even if three others exchange the size of iex come up which i don't see any way how somebody is doing that because all these exchanges like P- ptc and, and there's one more that has been there since like 10 years since iex started they haven't gone anywhere um these are all again government run entities uh they are not designed for efficiency or mm. doesn't have that lead of a technology so in my view i'm very biased towards iex and i don't believe uh, there's any threat of any other exchange taking away large share of volumes and causing uh, business deterioration to iex okay hey, perfect uh thank you so much for that sir okay next uh, question is uh, urvish shah sir ka and he wants to know if you have on himadri chemical and time technoplast uh time techno plus i i haven't read about it himadri chemical i haven't even heard the name i'm getting for the first time so no no opinion all right all right uh great so uh so questions hum log ke paas bahut sare aa rahe hain but i also do want to tweak in a little bit of my questions sure. uh and since we are coming close to uh, our closing time so i'll quickly do let's let's how about we do a quick uh, rapid fire round sure and uh, do a few questions sure okay so uh try to answer these without thinking so it will be more fun sure. but yeah uh if you on your birthday which stock would you like to receive as a gift uh the index give me nasdaq index awesome. as much as you want <laughs> awesome awesome uh what was your first trade ever which company did you which stock or index or company did you buy in your fir- with your first investment um i mean if it if it look if you look at dmat uh, that was uh, probably shares of dmart a uh, couple of years back uh, which i sold off okay uh, and if you look at mutual funds the my first financial trade was sit which i did when i was 20 years old so oh, wow. i have to figure out what sip was back then uh, and how to do it uh, yeah and then eventually i learned there's something called a direct mutual fund as well so then two years later i moved everything from regular mutual funds to direct awesome awesome uh what was your worst trade ever like it may be a missed opportunity or a missed exit or it may be some straight up uh, goof up and you know fat fingers on the uh, stock market what was your biggest something that you regret in the market biggest regret some somewhere um regret wise uh, i regret not investing uh, so i i knew about re- renewable space uh, like before there was like it was famous so in 2019 2018 i was looking at it my regret is that i didn't look deep enough in indian markets because there were a lot of companies uh, within the mid and small sector like i i still did pretty okay uh, i found good companies at very cheap rates like boros renewable and things like that uh, but i didn't look deep enough uh, so that's one of my big regrets uh, that even after knowing the sector i didn't go deep enough in it right thank you for sharing that sir uh 
uh okay what is your what has been your best trade ever like you that you are really proud of ki you did spot it and you were like bang on for it i would say it's been starting very early through sips my earliest sip was a uh, 1000 rupees uh, and that was through all the stipend i had collected by during college by internships and uh, remote work and uh, projects and things like that uh, and because i started that early uh, i kind of forced myself to build that habit uh and it's very easy to kind of get lost uh, at the early 20s in your uh, area and not a lot of people have that uh uh focus to kind of just pay themselves first and chip away like at that point like 500000 rupees doesn't seem a lot you you feel like what are you doing it's it's uh, it will never amount to a lot but uh, i've seen how regular sips and regular compounding and sticking through it for almost a decade kind of helps you uh build that foundation so today i'm kind of able to take a lot of risk in the stock market and um just because i kind of started that and i have a good base now right <laughs> perfect answer absolutely great okay uh next is uh yeah so your favorite trader it may he may be an inspiration he or she may be an inspiration or just absolutely best that you find or an investor ha uh, sure so uh, so stan rockmiller is something is a one of the guys i uh, very deeply admire in his teachings uh, then joel greenblatt is another one and uh, seth clark i would say these three are the people who i kind of have read everything about and i've kind of said google alerts for them if they have because they don't appear on media a lot uh, but whenever they do i kind of get an alert of some new content related to them awesome awesome uh, so you said uh, you don't track technicals much but fundamentals you do so what are your top 3 things to look for fundamentally in a company i wouldn't say there's anything top 3 you have to look at everything uh, so i look at things like float i look at what the history of the company is uh, one of the areas that i was stress a lot is the history of the company not a lot of people kind of go through the history uh, or bother to kind of go through 10 years back history of the company and but but the history of a company can teach you a lot uh, about how the management kind of behaved uh, when during the stress times during times of uh, great optimism and bull markets and bear markets so that's one area i look at entire financials you have to i look at things like float uh, pretty obvious things like debt and stuff i study go through auditors reports uh, so it has to be holistic there's not a there's never a formula in finance that buy above the speed sell below the speed it doesn't work uh, everybody since like has when they come in they, they always try to look for a formula but there is none you will never find a formula uh every company is different uh every industry is different um the reason why for example iex can command a higher price and it may be cheap cheap at 30 times earnings whereas a commodity or a steel company might be very expensive at 30 times earnings or uh, uh, 4 times 5 times book value so it's it's you have to you you can't apply a single formula to everything you have to look at it in context and that will only come when your foundations are strong absolutely perfect sir uh, right so we are very close to our closing time so my final question is uh, okay. i would like love to have a quick short concluding remark from it maybe an advice for us a suggestion for us uh, most of us at least me i still am very new to markets and i'm still a very much a learner so some final advice from you to uh, retail investors who are new to markets like uh, know your goal and uh, like for example most people i know they just just want to uh, like when i interact with new investors like they want a target return they want 20% return or 25% cashback but they don't know why uh, for example if you if you let's say have one cr in bank and you, and you want to make it to let's say six crs by the in the in the 10 years you need like a less than 15% kind of a return you you don't need to bother yourself with fno in that in that regard um uh, so know what your return what your goal post is and then work backwards from there uh, as to where you are today where you want to be 10 years or 20 years or whatever your goal is 
uh, and what that means in terms of actual percentage and from there on kind of figure out what what works for you that's why for majority of the people index funds and investing in the index passively and doing sips will work tremendously well uh, if you just learn a little bit things about um, how to look at uh, select uh, investment managers or which fund is good or what is an expense ratio uh, that, that amount of effort is like probably a few hours worth of effort com- compared to decades that you may put in the stock market and which not maybe not necessary because if you want 10 12% returns then why bother that with all of that that that's basically my plus great absolutely great sir thank you so much for uh, sharing all of that with us and uh, uh, i mean this is a closing time but i really really want to continue so many more questions to you and our audience ke itne sare questions hain jo ki pending mein reh gaye i really apologize uh, to our audience who asked us such nice questions you couldn't take up take them up for the uh, lack of time but uh, i would request uh, tarik sir please uh, allow us to host you again sometime we'll discuss a lot more we'd sure. love to learn from you a lot more Yeah, definitely. We'll do this again someday. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you for uh, having me. Right. So <laughs> this has been our time. Thank you so much Tarik sir again for making out time for us. It was a great fun learning session and of course our lovely audience. Thank you so much for being with us all throughout. At one point I think we had over 250 listeners. Uh That's this awesome. has been amazing. Thank you so much everybody and especially Tarik sir. Thank you. Thank you everybody.